Hello and welcome to another video from the conscientious biologist Ben Gallagher. This video is on photosynthesis. It's the second lesson in a sequence of two and covers plant physiology. It's suitable for GCSE level, but I really suggest you've watched the photosynthesis one video first. It would also be useful if you've watched the cell biology lessons and the two videos on transport through membranes, which are the diffusion and active transport and the osmosis presentations. So in that first photosynthesis presentation, I introduce you to these five vital questions. What is the point of photosynthesis? How does the plant trap sunlight? What are the main limiting factors that affect photosynthesis? How is the plant adapted to maximize photosynthesis? And how can we investigate it? Just to very quickly recap those first three. The first one, what's the point of photosynthesis? Remember, it's an energy conversion. It's the plant grabbing the energy from sunlight and locking it up in a molecule of glucose, which it can use at another time. How does it trap the sunlight? That's the vital question that you need to understand, that you'll be quizzed on in your exams, or just to expand your knowledge of biology. That's the chemical reaction part, using chlorophyll as the catalyst to combine the atoms from carbon dioxide and water to build the glucose molecule to trap the sunlight. You get some oxygen left over as well, but you must know both the word and symbol equations for that. The main limiting factors for photosynthesis are temperature. So go back and review your understanding of collision theory on that. There's a presentation on my site. The carbon dioxide and water availability are obviously going to be massive factors that can limit photosynthesis because they're the two necessary reactants. The chlorophyll is the catalyst. The more you've got, the faster you can do photosynthesis. And of course, sunlight uh, intensity and availability is going to speed up the reaction as well. This presentation mainly focuses on how the plant is adapted to maximize photosynthesis. That's all the key physiology uh, that you have to cover about plants. So let's start to have a look at that now. So let's begin this slide by taking a look at the plant as a whole and seeing how the entire organism is set up to maximize the photosynthesis that it can do. So to start this off, let's discuss that plants are made like all organisms, of key organs. There's four main plant organs, one of which we're not going to discuss today because it's not used in photosynthesis, and that's the flower. The flower's only function is for reproduction. So we're going to focus on the other three. Now, if we've got a diagram of a plant here, we can label the main organs that are used in photosynthesis. Obviously, we've got the leaf, that's the main site of photosynthesis, but we've got the stem and we've got the roots. Now, each one of these three has a vital, vital role in providing for what's needed for photosynthesis. But if we look at the leaf to start off with, look at its shape. It's very large. It's flat. It's got a massive surface area. That's just to try and catch as much sunlight as possible as the sunlight's coming down. Carbon dioxide required for photosynthesis is also taken in by the leaf because it's got tiny holes underneath called stomata. So the carbon dioxide can go in through those. The oxygen that's produced will also lead through those. So you can almost think of the leaf as being the part of the plant that's doing the breathing, but carbon dioxide in and oxygen out. Whereas for us, we need to breathe oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. It's the other way around. Water is required for photosynthesis. That's brought into the plant through the roots by the process of osmosis. Now, it's really, really important that you go back and review my osmosis video if you haven't already done that, because taking in the water through the root is such a key part of the curriculum. So water goes in, but you've also got tubes that run up through the plant called the xylem tubes. Now, the xylem will carry water right the way up from the root, right up through the stem into the leaves, to the site of photosynthesis where it's required. Now, the main part in the leaf that requires that water and the carbon dioxide are cells called palisade cells. Those are found in a layer of cells, a layer of tissue called the palisade mesophyll. So that's really the layer that needs to be supplied with the reactants for photosynthesis. And those are the cells that contain the most chlorophyll and the most chloroplasts. So that's really the engine of photosynthesis. Now, the glucose that's created in the leaf obviously can't stay in the leaf or the leaf would get bloated with glucose. It would get too heavy and it could break off the plant. So you've got to get rid of that glucose and send it around the plant. So that glucose is taken out through other tubes called the phloem. So the phloem tubes will carry the glucose out and carry it up or down the plant for whatever purpose that glucose is going to have. So just to summarize those on the diagram, the leaf is the site of photosynthesis but it's also the site of gas exchange. Again, carbon dioxide in, oxygen out, and it's where light gets collected. 
The stem, as far as photosynthesis is concerned, is just for transport, bringing the, ox um, the water up the plant to the leaf and taking the glucose away. The stem does have other functions, obviously, it's to get the leaves up higher, to compete with other plants around it, but that's nothing to do with photosynthesis. The roots function is to uptake the water. Without water, the photosynthesis can't happen, so it plays an essential role. It might be worth pausing there and taking a screenshot of that that you can add to your notes. So you can see from the last slide how it really is the leaf that's driving the photosynthesis. So we need to drill down into that a little bit more and cover some of the details of how the leaf is set up to maximise that. So on the diagram you can see next to me here, you've got a cross section of a leaf. Let's just make sure you know what you're looking at here. This is as if you could look sideways on into a leaf, but massively, massively enlarged. So that layer that's labelled waxy cuticle up there, that's the top of the leaf. That's the kind of shiny layer that you get on top of most leaves. On the bottom, you can see lower epidermis. That would be the very bottom of the leaf. So if you had a leaf and you were looking up to it, you'd be looking at the lower epidermis. That's what this diagram is trying to show you. Now, as I said in the last slide, the main thing that's driving photosynthesis, that's the engine of photosynthesis, are the palisade cells in that palisade mesophyll layer. So that's what we're going to focus on now. Now, at this stage, it's worth taking just a couple of minutes to review what we mean when we talk about cells, and tissues and organs. And just make sure you're happy with the hierarchy of those. So to start off with a cell, that's the smallest structural and functional unit of an organism. It's the smallest unit of life. Now in this context, that's when we're talking about the palisade cell. When we're talking about tissues, we're talking about the palisade mesophyll tissue. Now a tissue is a group of specialized cells, like the palisade cell, with similar structure and function. But if you've got lots of them together working together, but all of the same sort of type, that's a tissue. An organ is where you've got multiple tissues working together. So it's a collection of different tissues working together to carry out specific functions. In this case, the organ is the leaf because it contains palisade mesophyll, spongy mesophyll, epidermis, those different layers, but they're all working together to maximize photosynthesis. That's a key bit of background. Let's jump back to our topic though of just trying to talk about the leaf as a structure. So <clears throat> the palisade cells are specialized cells that are the primary location for photosynthesis, but they've got three main adaptations to maximize the photosynthesis they can do. The first one of these is their location. So if you remember back from the previous diagram, the palisade mesophyll are up near the top of the leaf. And when you think sunlight's going to be coming down from above, it's going to go through that um, cuticle layer through the upper epidermis and then it's got the palisade layer right there so they're very close to the source of the sunshine. The second key thing is their length. Relative to a normal plant cell, if I put a normal plant cell here directly above my head, you can see that a normal plant cell is much much shorter than the very very long palisade cells that I've got up there. And there's a good reason for that. But a third adaptation of the number of chloroplasts. Again, if you compare these two cells that I'm showing you, there's far, far, far more chloroplasts in the longer palisade cell here to my side. Okay, The chloroplasts, if you're not sure, are the slightly darker green uh, rugby ball shaped objects. And let's just give you a quick review of all these different parts of a cell before we move on. So on a plant cell, you've got the cellulose cell wall around the outside to give it structure, prevent the cell from bursting and allow it to become pressurized so it can become turgid. Again, that's more explained in the osmosis videos. You've got the cell membrane that allows things to come in and out and that's like a skin for the cell. The cytoplasm that's the liquid inside the cell allowing everything to move around. The ribosomes that produce the proteins and remember proteins are so vital, they do everything for the cell. The nucleus that houses the DNA, the DNA being the instructions for how to build those proteins. Chloroplasts, which do the photosynthesis that we're talking about. Mitochondria that do the respiration, respiration is covered in other videos. And plant cells also have a large permanent vacuole for storage. <clears throat> Now, if we go back to focusing on the photosynthesis aspect of this, and we talk about how those three adaptations, the location, the length, and the number of chloroplasts, really help them to get as much light as possible and to pull that energy out of the light so that the chlorophyll can lock it up in a glucose molecule. So if I show on the diagrams now, two identical quantities of light entering both cell types, the palisade cell here and the ordinary plant cell above me. Now, if we've got identical quantities of light coming in very, very soon, 
you'll see on the diagram of the palisade cell, that arrow is now significantly smaller because a lot of that energy from that sunlight has been pulled into the chloroplasts and locked up in glucose. On this cell above me, the normal cell, there's far fewer chloroplasts, so the arrow hasn't shrunk quite so much because a lot of that light energy is still continuing down through the plant. If I click on one more arrow, you can see again, in the palisade cell, loads of that energy has now been sucked out by that large number of chloroplasts. That arrow is now very, very thin. There's not a lot of energy left that's moving through the plant. Whereas on the one above my head, the ordinary cell, there's still quite a lot of energy coming through because there weren't the chloroplasts to pull that energy out. Now at this stage in the normal plant cell, the energy's already made its way through. And you can see a lot of the energy that came down to the plant is still there, is just traveling down through the plant. Whereas in my palisade cell, you can see the energy is still inside the cell because it's so long. And in fact, that arrow now, as it moves through the final part of the very long palisade cell, there's very, very little energy left coming out the other end of the palisade cell. Almost all of that energy has been sucked out of the light as it's come through the palisade cell, pulled into the chloroplasts, and has been locked up in the glucose. So it's really, really important that they're very long with all those chloroplasts because that really does allow them to pull as much energy as they can out of the light as it passes through. Now, all three of those increase how much sunlight can be used, uh, absorbed and used to create glucose. So we've seen how the palisade cells are very, very well adapted to absorbing as much light as possible. Palisade cells are one of only two cells that you need to know as specialized cells. The other one being the root hair cells uh, in the root. Please go back to my presentation on osmosis for the details of that. But we can fill in now on this diagram about the palisade mesophyll that it's the main site of photosynthesis. So let's quickly pull up the equation of photosynthesis that should look very familiar from the previous photosynthesis one presentation. Now we can tick off a couple of these things because we can explain them. We know the sunlight, uh, which is the source of the energy is coming from above, is going through the cuticle and upper epidermis to those palisade cells. And we know how the palisade cells are adapted to absorb that. So let's give that a tick on the equation. Chlorophyll we can also give a tick to because we know the chlorophyll is in the chloroplasts and we know there's loads and loads of chloroplasts in those palisade cells. Let's look at some of the other things now. Let's look at carbon dioxide next. So carbon dioxide moves into the leaf through the stoma or stomata, it's just plural or singular, which are in the lower epidermis of the plant. Now either side of the stoma, which is the hole, are guard cells. Guard cells are kind of squashed together like that, but they can bend and open up to allow the gases to move through and they can close. The mechanism by which they need to do that is very important and is covered in the osmosis video. So please go back and review that. We're not going to be talking about that now. That carbon dioxide is going to move into the leaf by diffusion following a concentration gradient because there will be more carbon dioxide in the external air than there will be inside the air spaces of the spongy mesophyll. That carbon dioxide will diffuse into the spongy mesophyll and the spongy mesophyll allows the carbon dioxide to diffuse through the leaf to get to all of those palisade cells above so that all the palisade cells have got carbon dioxide that they can use in photosynthesis. That means we can give carbon dioxide a tick on our diagram as well. We know where it's come from, we know how it gets in. But the palisade cells are also going to be making oxygen. That oxygen is going to leave by the same way that carbon dioxide came in. It's going to go down through the spongy mesophyll and it's going to leave through the stoma. So I've put two arrows on the diagram for you there and we can add a quick description to the spongy mesophyll that it allows gases to diffuse and spread to the palisade cells. You'll notice there's no ticks on carbon dioxide, sunlight, chlorophyll and oxygen. We just got water and glucose to explain now. Now the water comes up to the leaf as we've mentioned before, through the xylem tubes, which are the veins that run through the middle of the plant, through the stem. So I've added to bring water to the diagram there. So we can give a tick to the water. Now the glucose, we've already said, can't stay in the leaves. It needs to be removed. And we've said it gets removed through the phloem tubes. So we can add that to our diagram as well. The phloem are to remove the glucose. So looking at the diagram now, you can see how the leaf is set up to do all of those key points in the photosynthesis reaction. The only layers we haven't mentioned are the waxy cuticle and the upper epidermis, or haven't mentioned them in terms of their function. Now the waxy cuticle is literally just a waterproof layer to try and stop water from getting down into 
um, the leaf and breaking things apart. It's also to minimize the evaporation of water out of the leaf so that the plant doesn't lose the vital water that it needs to maintain. So that's a waterproofing layer. The upper and lower epidermises are both just skin layers. Just like you have skin covering your body, it keeps the insides in and the outsides out. So the upper and lower epidermis, those are just skin layers. Now, a really, really common exam question, usually a six marker, is something along the lines of explain how the leaf is adapted to allow maximum photosynthesis. I would really, really strongly advise that you answer that question and simply that you keep your knowledge and understanding of the leaf to focusing on the six points of the photosynthesis equation above. If you can explain how the leaf is adapted to um, grab sunlight by having lots and lots of chlorophyll and that those are long to keep the sunlight as trapped as possible, that you can explain how it gets the carbon dioxide through the stoma by diffusion using the spongy mesophyll layer to spread them out. If you can explain how the water is brought through the xylem, but of course you also need to explain how the water was absorbed by the roots using root hair cells by osmosis. There's a lot of detail there. That's going to be worth a lot of marks. Then you need to add to that how the glucose is removed. Um, lastly, of course, you need to talk about the oxygen and how oxygen also leaves through the stoma. If you can hit those six key points of the equation, describing the multiple layers that are on there, then your understanding of the leaf is really, really strong. So we've come full circle back to our key questions and we can now fill in those bottom two. So how is the plant adapted to maximise photosynthesis? Well, there's a huge amount of information there, as you've seen by watching this presentation. But a very, very brief summary could be something along the lines of it has specialised organs and cells which can take in the required chemicals, carbon dioxide and water, and transport them to specialised palisade cells in the leaf where photosynthesis occurs. Now you, as I've said so many times, need to pile and pile and pile your detail into these answers. The more detail you can give, the better the marks you're going to get. Very lastly, and we're only going to talk about this very, very briefly, but how can you investigate photosynthesis? Now, there's various methods for this, but an easy way, and this could be the way that you use uh, in descriptions in your exam, is to use aquatic or water plants, because if the plant is already underwater, you'll be able to see it forming bubbles of oxygen. That oxygen is going to come off. You could count the bubbles. You could measure the volume of oxygen that's giving off by collecting it. There's various things that you can do there. But we can say for definite that the oxygen produced would be the dependent variable. You need to have a think about what you could use as an independent variable. And that really is pretty simple because you can just jump back a couple of questions to the limiting factors. You could investigate the effect of temperature on oxygen production and photosynthesis or the carbon dioxide concentration, water availability, quantity of chlorophyll. A bit more tricky, but you could get different plants if you could see that they were very different in colour and use that as some kind of independent variable. Or you could just change the sunlight intensity. That's the most common experiment. And you can do that just by moving a lamp closer or further away from the plant. The closer it is, the higher the intensity. Have a look at those. Have a think about that, because you're almost definitely going to get questions on how to investigate photosynthesis. But as with all experimental questions, the key things are to think about the aim, which is what's your independent variable, what's your dependent variable. And your aim should always be something along the lines of how does my independent variable affect my dependent variable? You need to keep the experiment fair by controlling all the other limiting factors, controlling the other variables. You need to make sure you've made it reliable by repeating your experiment multiple times so you can get rid of any anomalous data and calculate a reliable mean from the data that you have. Please go back and review how to do experimental plans and evaluations. It's such an important skill. As always with this, with these questions, the greater the level of detail you can use when answering them, the higher you will score on your exam. But those questions there essentially summarise everything you need to know about photosynthesis. It's just about the detail you can give. Thanks for listening.